out of all the bands that emerged in the immediate aftermath of punk rock in the late 1970s, The Cure was one of the most enduring and popular. Led through numerous incarnations by guitarist and vocalist Robert Smith, the band became notorious for their slow, gloomy songs and Smith's ghoulish appearance. As one of the bands that laid the seeds for goth rock, The Cure have enjoyed a hugely successful 25-year career, which has seen nearly 30 million album sales worldwide. began life in 1976 in the southern English town of Crawley. Four school friends, Paul Thompson, Michael Dempsey, Lawrence Lowell Tolhurst and Robert Smith decided to form a band, which they named Easy Cure. The Cure came together, it's basically a school band, I mean, pretty punk, just so, so it's interesting. They, they kind of got counted as kind of a post-punk band, but their actual roots lie before punk. I think it's, it's basically, obviously, Robert Smith as a driving force right from the start with a couple of schoolmates, putting the band together, playing the youth club circuit. So it's, it's, it's like your classic British kind of school band, never really having a plan to get anywhere. But right from the start, they, they had more of a quirky kind of um, idea to what they were doing. I think Robert Smith's just a really good songwriter and a really good, like, um, he's got a really good imagination. By 1978, Paul Thompson had dropped out of the band and the remaining members changed their name to The Cure. A demo tape found its way to Polydor A&R man Chris Parry, who was impressed enough by what he heard to ask for a meeting with the band. Chris Parry heard them and really liked them. And he got them a deal on Small Wonder, which is like one of the hundreds of indie labels around the time. It's one of the more successful ones. And they put the first single out on that, but then he realised there's a bigger potential, so he took them and formed his own label called Fiction, which he did as a subsidiary of Poly Polydor, which is a bigger label. And put them on that, and that kind of uh, support really helped the cure as well. Because being an independent label, idealistically, was fantastic, but it's a really rubbish way of trying to get anywhere because there's just no support at all. Seventies was an interesting decade in terms of music. I mean, there were all kinds of things going on, like glam rock, and you had Tamla, and you had prog rock, and uh, um, certainly that that sort of the, the prog rock was lending itself to something suddenly going boom, something was going to explode, something was going to happen, and of course that was. Um, was punk. 1977 was really the high point of punk rock. Everything was thrashing, everything was bondage trousers and, and big hair and safety pins and, you know, torn T-shirts and all that malarkey. And The Cure came along and they really were something different. They had an enormous charm. They were very English. Their music was very English, I always thought. And very home counties English, you know, it was very much about southern, southern England. Um, it was very unpretentious, but at the same time, it was very much its, it, its own thing. In the winter of 1978, The Cure began recording the basis of a debut album. Harry produced and was keen that the group's sound should be sufficiently different from that of the punk phenomenon. Smith and Parry developed a more stripped-down, enigmatic sound, and in December, the band were invited to record a selection of tracks for the John Peel sessions. A whole generation of people were listening to Peel every night and reading papers, looking for something different all the time, saying, what's next, what's next? That was a question all the time. What's going to happen next? We want to... Just... There's a hit list of things to check out, you know. You hear someone say, go and check this band out for Cure, you know. Or you'd listen to Peel and you'd have a session. That was the first time I heard them. And it's just like, wow, this sounds great, this is so different. In early 1979, the band returned to the studio and begun recording in earnest. Their debut album, Three Imaginary Boys, was released in May to largely good reviews in the British music press. People just trying to change rock into something completely different, just being obstinate, really, just, just being a pain in the arse. And the cure seemed to fit in with that very quickly. So, so the, because the whole generation was looking for this and it was getting encouraged, people were taking risks. And when you hear the first Cure album, there's a lot of risks musically and sonically being taken on that record. It, it seemed like a manufactured sort of punk new wave construct that you couldn't really take seriously. And I got to review their first album 
and I and I hated the whole packaging. It seemed to be it seemed to be there was a concentration on trying to market mystery, and that really at that time got up my nose. And I happened to review it on the night that Margaret Thatcher got elected, and I was in a really bad mood, and I really took it out somewhat on the album. The first album doesn't actually sound anything like Later Cure, apart from like the Smiths' voice, which is like the constant. They they don't. Apart from Three Imaginary Boys, it doesn't even have that kind of doomy kind of sound to it. It's very kind of quirky. The, the mix is really weird as well. You get like a really quiet guitar, really loud drums, or it'll suddenly flip the other way around. It's really interesting the way it's mixed. I was always wondering if there's like a um, kind of almost a dub reggae mix, kind of influence in there, the way things are mixed almost back to front. And they did a record 1015, which again was very, very stripped down, was very very much not the thrash of, of, of punk rock, which was very sort of linear, blocky sort of music, you know, the Clash or the Pistols or the Susie and the Banshees. Well, actually, not so much the Banshees, but Buzzcocks or something, which was very much a, a thick block of sound from the first bar to the last bar. Um, the Cure music at that time was, was very spiky and angular and, and slightly uncomfortable, slightly disjointed, and, and, and I like that because it took you by surprise always. There's a starkness to the sounds, and it's very experimental. But in that period, people were trying to uh, redefine what rock music was and change it into something else. It wasn't like verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle bit, guitar, solo, and out. There was a bit like you have a, a long intro and then the end, or just... Whatever you normally do, let's do the opposite. So, like, guitar solo will turn the guitar down really quiet. So you can hear that in the, in the way these tracks are mixed. There was definitely some kind of thought of trying to make this... It's very art rock, and it's, it's a very conscious effort to, like, redefine the premises of rock and roll. And even the artwork of the record as well, you know, with the... Uh, just the little... The tracks, don't even, they're not even named on the record. They just have little pictures for each track. And the covers just do not even have the name of the band or the name of the album on the cover. It's just, like, a random kind of... Uh, bits of furniture from a house. It's very, very much the time that people like trying to like change what rock and roll was and what it sounded like and what it looked like and what it's perceived as. I think there was something about that first album they didn't particularly enjoy themselves. I think there was something quite fake about the whole thing and the and the, the little um, squiggles and, and sort of symbols for the song titles and all that seemed really annoying and didn't really seem to reflect what they were really interested in. I mean, I think it was interesting that they'd come, you know, out of the sort of strange Bowie world uh, of, of both pop songs and, and, and soundscapes. And at that time, you couldn't really tell. Everything seemed to be like uh, a desperate need to be uh, interesting rather than just being as interesting as they actually were, which slowly developed from there. And then I became a huge fan. The recording of Three Imaginary Boys had been characterised by frequent and often heated studio debate between Parry and Smith. Harry had been vocal with his ideas for the band, while Smith had been equally keen to assert his own vision of the cure, a vision on which he was not prepared to compromise. I think from the start, it was very much Robert Smith's project. I, th I think he wanted other people to contribute, but maybe they, could, they didn't couldn't contribute enough. I think, well, the original lineup from Lowell Tollers to Matthew Hartley, I, th I think he wanted it to be everybody writing songs, but. I think he's just a very creative. He's a very creative person. It's hard if you're in a band with somebody. He's, very, he's a very good songwriter. I mean, other people did contribute bits and, and they did write the odd song, but Robert Smith stuff is just just so much better. It's like any of those bands at the time. That, well, any band at any time, there's always one, maybe two, dominant members in a group. Robert was very much the man with his hand on the rudder, uh, but Lal and Michael Dempsey uh, were also quite um, strongly opinionated, I, 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 I imagined. And uh, I, I thought there must be some fantastic bust-ups in this studio when these three are, 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 are recording something. Robert Smith must have been, as a, as a child, must be very into, like, almost like progressive rock, or it must, there must have been some, like, kind of rock music kind of influence as well, very art rock kind of thing going on. But I think when punk came along, it obviously galvanised them and energised the sound, although they were never, ever a straight kind of punk rock band. But that created the audience for them to exist in. I mean, there was... Well, people who got into punk weren't just listening out for bands that sounded totally like punk. People looking for, like, people who were going to change rock and roll. This is the whole idea at the time that rock and roll was going to change. And there was contemporary bands for The Cure. There was, like, uh, Joy Division, who I think were a massive influence. I always think what, what was interesting about The Cure is that they'd really come out of something like David Bowie and, and the idea that David Bowie had written a lot of very strange singer-songwriter-type songs, like early on with Hunky Dory and Space Oddity. And then he'd, he'd experimented with this idea of glam pop songs with, you know, Ziggy Stardust and 
and, he, and, and up to Diamond Dogs. And I think Diamond Dogs was quite a key thing because then that bled into that area where he worked with Eno and Lowe and Heroes. And I think that all that really is the seed of the cure. They come out of a sort of gloom rock um, strand as well. I've always liked the Leonard Cohen's of the world or, or the... Um, you know, some of that more gloomy Joy Division stuff, which I suppose was around more or less at the same time, which was the post... Uh, after that first huge explosion of punk rock, you got this Echo and the Bunnymen thing or Teardrop Explodes thing or, you know, the Liverpool mob or, or Howard DeVoto and the magazine and um, the, the Cure and then... Later on, you got bands like Bauhaus and, and going into the new romantic thing of the early 80s, I suppose. In the summer of 1979, The Cure were asked to support Susie and the band she's on tour. They had only performed a couple of dates when the tour took an unexpected turn. First big tours the Cure did was support the Banshees, which is a perfect tour for them, really. The Banshees always had really good support bands. It was one of the things out of punk. You didn't wait for your manager to order you what band to take out of the road you. The, the, a lot of bands at the time were very interested in what was going on, listening to other groups, and they, they picked The Cure to do the tour with them. So the, the, Cure, the, the tour starts, it gets going, and the Banshee split up on about the third day to the tour when, when the rhythm section, when the guitar player, the drummer, just walks out, walks out on, on the Banshees. But the, the, because the band, Susie's got this really kind of persevering attitude, and instead of, like, scuttling off back to London and giving up, they decide to carry on, and they asked Robert Smith to play guitar with them. He learns the songs overnight, and they carried... Well, I think they missed out one day to just carry on the tour. I think he was more annoyed than, than possibly we, we, we were, because it was his first big tour, and, you know, these two people were pulling the rug out from under his feet and immediately. So by the end of the evening, he kind of offered his services, and we just sort of laughed it off and forgot all about it. Well, we didn't forget, but we didn't think it was possible. And uh, we went through about a week of really torturous auditions for people. And then um, we just asked Robert, and he just turned up and played three songs immediately, perfectly. And we said, can you do two sets a night? And he said, of course. You know, and that, that was it. We, we were back on, uh, on, the, on the road within a week. It seemed odd at the time. It was like some kind of thing Eric Clapton would do, being two groups at once, a kind of, you know, super group. Uh, but, but Robert did it out of some kind of perversity, as long as The Cure could, could keep supporting, you know, giving himself double the work as well, you know, I mean, he, unbelievable, really. So the, the, the tour carried on with Robert, now part of Susan and the Banshees, which he, 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 he wasn't necessarily the greatest guitar player Susan and the Banshees ever had, because there was something, you know, there was, there was something about him that was other, that, that didn't quite fit. But um, I think out of his pop idealism, he wanted to make it work, because, wow, what a great opportunity to suddenly be in this really successful group and I'm the guitar player. It was, it was quite strange during, during the tour because I felt um, there was quite a bit of... Um, in some strange way, the, the, the fact that Robert was playing with the Banshees as well was kind of divorcing him from the rest of his band. And I think... I think Lowell was cool with it, but um, I think Michael was a bit um, maybe envious. I think it nearly killed him. I think, you know, the, the, the idea of doubling up and the idea of the tension it caused within the, the cure, the idea that, you know, he was suddenly in a more successful group. Uh, oh, and will he leave? And, and the idea of the cure without Robert Smith, well, it was no cure at all, you know. So I think it was, um, it was a typical move, really, in one sense, because it was out of... Uh, it was a kind of good-natured thing, but also it was incredibly messy and led to all sorts of psychodrama. And one of the great things about The Cure, of course, is the constant psychodrama. And this was one of those great soap moments, I think, in the, in the life of The Cure. I think Robert learned quite a lot by being in the band. I think he learned how to be a front person just by standing next to Susie every night for a couple of months. I think he completely changed his, his persona on stage because of that. Um, he came out of his shell. Um, I think that he learned how to be a bit fl more flamboyant and how it was OK. And I think he, he saw how, you know, how should we put it, Susie's more diva moments were kind of acceptable because they were the front person. And I think he learned how to get away with stuff. Um, 
and just a bit about stagecraft and learning how to use the audience a bit more because of, you know if you look at early clips of of their performances you can see he's sort of sort of he's much more shy and retiring than he becomes a bit later on and of course his whole look changes as well well his look at the beginning wasn't as extreme uh, as as it became and i think it became extreme because of his period in Susie and the Banshees and I think because he wasn't really part of the Susie thing and it was something that had just happened and almost sort of killed him in a way there was almost a sort of jokey response and he started to dress like Susie you know in a way and he started to be physically like Susie and I think that's really when that whole thing that became known as the goth thing came about I think for me it was that period he spent he wouldn't have worn a crucifix or anything without being in Susie I think he felt that was the uniform and because he takes those kind of things seriously he's in a group this is their uniform I will wear their uniform and and that whole sexual ambiguity thing I think came you know to kind of copy the way that Susie looked and Susie's look was such a big influence on the whole goth, what became known as goth. Uh, I think for that period, Robert got, kind of got dragged into that. And it, and it, and it kind of exaggerated his, his glam pop look uh, and turned it into something kind of somewhere between grotesque and inspiring. He borrowed Susie's lipstick and disappeared to the, 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 the um, toilet and came back with basically his trademark look. I think he was probably a bit worse for the wear in some fashion or other, but it sort of sprang from there, and I think he just, um, you know... They were, you know, he was already getting into this whole idea of the mask and stuff with, with pornography, and I think um, working with us just brought that out a bit more, and it, it gave him that sort of one sort of barrier between the real him and the audience that, that I think every sort of front performer needs. I mean, I don't suppose you can avoid it when people go, oh, him, you know, he looks like Joe Brand or, you know, and the lippy and stuff. But, you know, I've never, ever... I mean, I've always seen past it. And, and it's just the way he is. And I, I rather admire him for sticking to it as well. Isn't it true that Mary, she always liked him wearing the lippy and stuff? And so he said, well, you know, if she likes it, I'll keep it. Fair enough. I started wearing it on stage just because I've got very um, ill-defined features and I just wanted to make more of them. So it's not so much vanity, I don't think, because it's a bit too odd to be vain. It's more theatricality. Robert Smith's image was in incredibly important to The Cure's popularity, I think. Um, it, was, um, it, it was very clever because it was a very androgynous image, so you could copy it if you were a boy or a girl, which is quite unusual, you know, amongst rock stars generally. You know, you might get loads of blokes dressing up as you, you might get loads of girls dressing up as you, but you very rarely get both. But Robert Smith, if you went to one of his gigs, then, um, you know, it was actually quite difficult to tell the boys and the girls apart because they'd all have a ridiculous, you know, giant Black Widow spider perched on their heads. They'd all be dressed in black. A lot of them would be wearing sort of dubious, smudged makeup. And um, it, it was brilliant if you were a Cure fan because you could instantly recognise other Cure fans. You know, if you were on your first day at college, or, you know, at an indie disco. There was none of this, you know, sort of wondering, oh, I wonder if they like the same music as me, because if they were a Cure fan, you just knew, because they looked like Robert Smith. So you could just walk up and say, no, oh, into the Cure by any chance, and they'd always say yes. <laughs> Tensions within the cure that surfaced during Smith's flirtation with the Banshees came to a head in late 1979. Smith felt that an irreconcilable breach had developed between he and Dempsey, and Dempsey was ejected from the band to be replaced by Smith's longtime friend Simon Gallup. Keyboard player Matthew Hartley was asked to join the group, and in early 1980, the new four-piece began recording their second studio album, 17 Seconds. Standout track, A Forest, earned high praise from the music press. Killing an Arab is, is the one that's been, from the start, has been a really famous song, but Boys Don't Cry is the first kind of hit, and that's the one that kind of crossed them over quite a lot. But for me, the one song that really defines The Cure for me personally is The Forest. It's just got everything that's great about The Cure. It's very sparse, 
it's, it's a very, it's, it sounds a bit like the first album. It's got a kind of weird kind of sound to it. And it's very, it's very, it's very poppy and melodic, but it also sounds like that quintessential kind of dark, moody cure that kind of, and it's got that kind of weird kind of dream, childlike dream kind of feel to it. It's a very, um, I say modern, but I mean late seventies kind of piece of psychedelia. It's kind of very post-punk psychedelic. It's a very black and white kind of sound to it. And it sounds like it come from any kind of period of their career, it would fit in any album. So to me, A Forest is definitely the uh, quintessential Cure track. I mean, for me, the big one that, that really changed my whole mind about The Cure was, was A Forest. And I, I just thought that was a, a wonderful um, combination of, of spooky guitars and, and, and a dream voice. And, and, and there, a formula seemed to be developing. I, 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 yeah, the, the, the voice, the guitar, and also an image that seemed very specific to Robert Smith and his mental state. You know, his mental state is always a key factor in, in a Cure song. Uh, the combination of, of quite ordinariness, really, down-to-earthness, and yet something very strange and bizarre and, and far-fetched. So he's, he's, he's quite rooted in, in a funny sort of way, but he's also completely you know, off his head. And I, I guess that was the moment when I, I first started to notice that, that, that that was an interesting tension. The Cure's first world tour followed the release of 17 Seconds, but was marred by further bust-ups, which culminated in Hartley leaving the group. Reformed as a three-piece, The Cure began work on their next album, Faith. The Cure have been through various different incarnations, so I think when you, when you look at the early stuff, they were, they were by no means a sort of ordinary band, but they were much more ordinary than they became. So songs like, you know, Boys Don't Cry, which is an absolutely classic, you know, Cure pop song, was this kind of wiry, minimalist punk thing, you know. It, they, if, I, if I got into them in 1979 and heard a song like that, I'm sure I'd have really liked it. But in a way, you wouldn't have thought there was a band that was going to go on to make, you know, ten albums and become one of the biggest bands in the world. They seemed like a quirky British thing, their, um, their early stuff. It was when they got into the, the real gloomy stuff, faith and pornography, that was when the band really started to sort of resonate with, with um, a wider fan base. By faith, which to me was, you know, when it started to become interesting, they, they, there was a seriousness about the way that they were using sound, you know, so they, they, they could obviously write these kind of very haunting and attractive pop songs and like a forest was so seductive. And it seemed to have that combination of, of being about sound, pure sound coming out of Eno and Bowie, but also the idea of the pop song uh, coming out of the, the more sort of stranger end of David Bowie. And I, I guess because Diamond, Bog, Diamond Dogs was almost an original example of what became known as the gothic sound, you know, Diamond Dogs was almost ground zero for that in a way, you know, along with the American band The Doors. You know, those were the two areas where it began. And so it was, it was when the, the Cure started to really kind of get that sense that they had their own identity coming out of something that was interesting. But, but it was, you know, a mix. You know, Bowie kind of jumped from one thing to the other. The Cure seemed to put it all in one place. So there were these, you know, gorgeous soundscapes and occasionally these, these ravishing pop songs. In the winter of 1982, the Cure embarked on a UK tour supported by Steve Severin of Susie and the Banshees. When the tour wrapped up in December, the band retreated to the Windmill Studio to rehearse some new material. It was during these brief sessions that new tensions began to flare up, with Gallup accusing Smith of wanting to leave The Cure to collaborate with Severin. A confused and distant Smith journeyed to London and stayed at Severin's house, where he wrote the bulk of the lyrics for pornography. Robert was in this sort of mid, this sort of limbo between not, sh not sure, he wasn't really sure whether he wanted the cure to continue or whether he wanted to go solo. So he was sort of mid 82. Um, and he just used to turn up on my, my doorstep, at, you know, Friday night with a crate of different sort of beverages that, and he'd sit there making cocktails and we'd, we'd talk and watch videos because I'd just got a video player. Him and Severin sort of became quite good buddies and had all sorts of, uh, you know, experiments with psychedelia music and I suppose took a lot of acid together and, uh, and, and, and kind of um, lived quite a, an extreme life and found, found, it, found connections with things they were interested in, I think. You know, the, the darker side of David Bowie, Robert Smith sort of mapped onto Severin's kind of um, appreciation of, of, of truly dark things in life and the Edgar Allan Poe and everything. And I suppose they, 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 they did find a way to fit into the same glove, which was kind of interesting. In early
early 1982, The Cure recruited producer Phil Thornley to begin recording pornography at Rack Studios in London. The album was released in May 1982 to tepid reviews, and the ensuing tour was a disaster. A fist fight between Smith and Gallup ended the bassist's involvement with the band. Chris Parry tried to encourage Smith to take a new, more mainstream pop direction. Tolhurst moved on to Keys, and the band began recording upbeat singles such as Let's Go to Bed and The Walk, with session musicians on bass and drums. Smith, however, remained distracted and began to move closer to Severin, collaborating on a joint project, The Glove, as well as recording and touring with the Banshees. We got a lot of... Um negative vibes, as we should say, from fiction, because they, they felt Robert was getting pulled in too many directions. I think I was seen as like, you know, this kind of elemental on his shoulder, whispering in his ear, telling him not to be the cure, and, which wasn't the case at all. It was just that, you know, and I was there at one meeting with, with him and um, Chris Parry where he explained quite eloquently why he wanted to go and play with the Banshees for a second time, why he wanted to do the Glove album, just to get different experiences to add to The Cure. And, um, but I think Chris was, um, was very nervous that he was gonna go off and leave The Cure behind and join the Banshees permanently. So there was this all, there was this tug, tug of war going on. Um, which manifests itself more during the recording of the Banshees album Hyena in 84 that we did with Robert. The actual glove sessions were quite... They left us alone, you know. They, they never thought, you know... It was kind of like, oh, let the, let the two boys have their holiday and, you know, they'll come back to their senses eventually. In September 1983, The Glove released their only album, Blue Sunshine. The Glove got sort of mixed reviews. People to this day either love it or hate it. Um, but by that point, um, you know, the Banshees were suffering their first backlash. Um, so it kind, of, it kind of fell in the midst of that, and so it was seen as, you know, self-indulgent and, uh, you know, a waste of time. And, um, but we were quite open about it. We, we, you know, we, we just said, yes, it's totally self-indulgent. That is the whole point of it. Smith had spent much of 1983 splitting his time between a pop project with The Cure and working with The Banshees. Towards the end of the year, his relationship with The Banshees started to become strained. By the time he was in the band for the second time, I was really... I really was that elemental on his shoulder. I was trying to convince him to leave the cure behind and to join the Banshees full time. Selfish reasons, of course, because, you know, number one, he was my friend, and number two, I wanted the Banshees to get some st stability. And I think, you know, <clears throat> I was definitely trying to squeeze Lowell out of the picture. I make no bones about that. But you know, I respected his wishes and that, you know, and kind of in the back of my mind, I knew he would never kind of give up the cure because he had too much of a personal vision to be subsumed in, into another band, particularly with such a strong front person as Susie. Even though, you know, he's been very conscientious and very determined and very neurotically needy of having the band, the cure, I think for me it's always just been Robert Smith and this loose band of people that throw cure type shapes. You know, there's a, there's a certain way that a cure member must look and, and, and hold his instrument and, and it gives the illusion for Robert who seems to need it that he's in a band that kind of helps keep him together. But for me it's always been, you know, from the very, very early days, really, Robert Smith. You know, to the extent on someone like The Top you get the feeling that he did it all, that it was all him. You know, this great kind of multi-instrumentalist kind of brilliance that, that, that was the true kind of essence of, of, of this thing he calls the cure, but for me is Smith. I never used to be able to, to put any feelings of optimism or hope or anything into songs. It was always complete despair. Even though my, my actual personality was always quite balanced, or as balanced as it is, you know. But now, <laughs> I, it, what the cure do tends to reflect a, like a whole more than just one particular piece of it's more like a group mentality yeah let's go to bed was pro probably the only contrived 
record we ever made and ever will make because it was designed to completely break the mould of, of what The Cure had become, which I thought was very static and almost stagnant. Robert Smith is The Cure. That's definitely true. And, um, you know, you couldn't imagine The Cure without Robert Smith. But obviously there has been The Cure without any other band member you can think of because, you know, uh, apart from The Fall, he's probably had more line-up changes of, of any band in history. But I think the key to a successful Cure lineup was always whether it was people who were prepared to follow Robert Smith where he wanted to go. He's got a really, as far as I can tell anyway, got a really committed um, approach to making a record that, um, you know, he demands full-on commitment from everybody. And if he's going to make a sort of bleak, depressing record, then, you know, he wants everybody to be having a bleak, depressing time. If he's making an upbeat uh, pop record, then, you know, he wants everybody to be having an upbeat pop time. So there have been... And certain members of the Cure that have been really important to that sound. I mean, obviously Lowell Tolhurst, who uh, fell out very badly with Robert Smith eventually and was kicked out of the band, was certainly key to you know their early um, stuff, and you know had a big had a big impact on the on the band musically uh, and in terms of certainly their spirit. Um, and it, it went fairly hideously wrong, obviously, <laughs> in the in the long run. But um, you can't underestimate the impact of, of all the bit players. And, and the fact that they conquered America is not just down to the fact that Robert Smith wrote brilliant songs. It's because he went out there with a band who could, you know, rock out with the best of them. Because you can't appear in front of 65,000 people, uh, you know, in some uh, barn of a stadium that's used to hold in uh, baseball games, unless your band can rock. I think what always struck me about um, Robert Smith, and certainly uh, when I first met him, you get the impression it's like with his, his, his marriage, his relationship uh, with Mary, he's in something for um, the duration. Um, and I think that's something that, that struck me. I mean, he, he along with a, a lot of other people as well, but it's... It's, it's, it's a career, it's longevity. I think the key to Robert Smith's appeal as a fan is that you're never quite sure where you are with him. He's enigmatic in the very best sense of the word. Um, you know, if you just listened to his records, you'd think he was some sort of uh, lovelorn poet up in his attic, you know, tearing his hair out in despair. But then you read his interviews and you find out that he actually spends a lot of the time, you know, like he's... Uh, uh, like he's I don't know, a footballer, perhaps. He seems to spend all his time, you know, playing football, getting drunk and having a good time. So it's that kind of unique thing that he can be, you know, sort of uh, a, one of the lads and he can be this kind of enigmatic poet figure, which makes him really intriguing as a person. I think one of the things that, that made us sort of fast friends was uh, his sense of humour. He's got a really... Um, a really good sense of humour and that's not something that comes out too often in, in the work that he does and there's no reason why it should. Um, but, you know, you, the public face of somebody isn't, isn't always what, what they're really like. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's, I think that's key to a lot of creative work is understanding the, the sense of humour and the jokes that you can you can throw in to, you know, um, just sort of soften the blows of, of all the other stuff that you're, you're trying to deal with. We don't sing really about issues that are, that are socially relevant, particularly, so that they're, they're not placed in England. There's a lot of, if you get caught up in singing about social or political issues in, in England, it tends to alienate a lot of people, because they don't understand what he's on. I mean, I don't understand British politics. The thing about Robert Smith's voice is that, on the surface, it's rubbish. <laughs> if he turned up at a pop idol audition, they'd, they'd kick him out within, you know, ten seconds and just tell him he can't sing. Um, and I suppose technically they, they might be right. But wh when it comes to conveying emotion and a range of emotion, then obviously he'll knock any you know, winner of American Idol um, you know, into next week. Because it's really quirky which is really good, especially in an era when most singers were fairly bland production line, uh, you know, Stock Aitken Waterman type thing. 
Um, so to hear somebody essentially squawking <laughs> like some kind of mad bird uh, over a record was, you know, was A, really refreshing, but he's got a lot of range as well, so he can do kind of dark and doomy, and he can do up and poppy, and be equally convincing on both. And a song like, something like Just Like Heaven, for example, if that was sung perfectly, I don't think it would be as good a record as it is. Um, it would just lose something. It would feel like more of a cliché pop record. But in his hands, I think the fact that, you know, he's a bit sloppy with it makes it just, you know, that's the, the missing ingredient that makes it just a, a brilliant record. I think Robert, Robert's got a very distinctive voice. Um, you know it's him immediately. Um, and so, somehow it always seems as though it's, very, it's, it's a very emotive voice. Um, there again, it's, you know, it's, it's a kind of... Uh, people either love it or they don't, um, which is usually a sign of, of, of something that's that good, in my opinion, um, or at least unique. I love the way I can just... Uh, uh, there's a kind of... There's a passion in every note, every thing he does, the way he says words, how he phrases. Um, and, I, it, well, I, you know, the thing that struck me uh, most originally was, it was the first thing, you know, sometimes it might be a riff, might it? Uh, and, and in the case of Robert Smith, it was the voice that is, it is vulnerable. Um, it's got so many different emotions. It can be sound paranoid sometimes, sound manic. Um, but, you know, he, he, he pulls off so many different things with the voice. It's his best instrument. Apart from the very obvious sort of, sort of songwriting and the, and, the, and the singing, I always felt that Robert was a really kind of underrated guitarist. Having seen how he could so easily put life into some of the Banshee's songs which weren't written by him, um, I knew that there was much more to him as a guitar player than than had really been previously seen. So um, when we came to do the Glove album, I really wanted to sort of push that area of him, and I think he, I think some of his best guitar playing is on that album, just because I think he just, you know, he wasn't the front person. You, you know, we were doing it together, and we basically got somebody else in to sing, and so. Uh, you know, there was a couple of moments on that album where he really lets loose as a guitarist, and I think it's fantastic. He can play virtually any mood, um, but one of the great things that he's, he's able to do is create an atmosphere with his guitar playing. I mean, most people can pick up a guitar and strum a few chords, but he's able to, with the tuning, he uses all different kinds of tunings on the guitars as well. So uh, those moods that he's able to create uh, kind of, for my own personal taste, remind me of Joni Mitchell a bit because she uses a lot of different tunings on the guitars. His voice is his calling card. That's the great thing. I mean, <laughs> just like Bob Dylan's voice or, or Johnny Rotten's voice is his calling card, so it is with, uh, with Robert. That and his hair. <laughs> and I think... They've been incredibly astute over the years that however far out they've gone from that original Cure sound, the two things that have remained constant are the hair and the, uh, the voice. Um, and that's great branding. You know, you've got to have product identification in the modern world of, of marketing and profiling. And, pornography tour had been an uncomfortable experience for The Cure, it had also provided an occasion for the band to develop their visual image. The band members wore lipstick around their mouths and eyes and begun to articulate a clear sense of their live identity. First time I saw play live, there, there was a... Um, there was Robert Smith would kind of stand there, hold his guitar and sing, and there was not much movement. Very charismatic, though, he didn't have to do anything. Simon Gallup would do like kind of like he does now, kind of hunch over his bass and move backwards and forwards, very kind of uh, stranglers, stroke, uh, Peter Hook thing going on there. And that, that was a performance. They had a film as well. They, they showed 
a film in the background they made, like a very kind of art, arty kind of film. It's very stark lighting and very dark, but they didn't need a big performance because the music was so dense, it kind of pulled you in. It wasn't like there's a massive mosh pit at the front, you know. Well, there was for like a forest and slightly faster songs, but people were just kind of like captivated by the music. It was that kind of audience. A Cure gig is always about atmosphere. Now, by the time I was going to see The Cure, they were already playing big places. And, uh, in fact, I've only seen The Cure play sort of really big gigs. But even when they were playing a massive, you know, arena or they were playing Glastonbury Festival, which they've got a really good connection with, um, or they were playing, you know, in Orange in a massive amphitheatre and you were actually sat on a hill half a mile away, um, they were really, really good at retaining the atmosphere of a small gig. Now, it's partly because of the sense of community of the fans, um, and partly because they're a really, really good live band. But I think they would never sacrifice, um, you know, they wouldn't subscribe to that cool indie idea of, you know, it's not about performing. Um, and that's why they succeeded with so many bands didn't, because they would always put on a show. Now, not a show in the fact that they weren't doing dance routines, <laughs> you know, they weren't um, having dancing girls on stage, but they would always make sure that um, the visuals or the lights or the smoke or whatever always, you know, would enhance their performance. When you saw The Cure live on stage, mostly you saw a band very intent on delivering their music in an uncompromising Pink Floyd type way, relying on lights and shadows really to give the illusion of some atmosphere. But effectively they were there pretty much just, just going through the music, they were just delivering the songs. And I think because it was all coming out of Robert Smith's mind to an extent, and we saw little hints of it with the hair and the lips, but, but essentially it was a mental state he was delivering, so physically he, he wasn't a, you know, a natural performer, and I, th I guess his size counted against him, the old fat bob thing, you know, he wasn't necessarily going to throw loads of poses and jump about and, and give that kind of physical resonance. So it did, it did have that slight sort of sense of a, of, a, of, a deliver of a concert, like Pink Floyd, a concert of music. It was that serious side of Robert, you know. Uh, that he tried to give great disguise with the hair and the lips, but effectively a serious musician, you know, delivering serious songs that had serious, you know, sort of import about them. And that's really what you got from their live shows, I think. In the late summer of 1983, Phil Thornley and Andy Anderson joined The Cure on bass and drums, respectively. The new Look Cure recorded the hit single Love Cats and a collection of pop singles and B-sides Japanese Whispers was released in December 83. I'll always have a great deal of affection for the Love Cats because A, it was one of the records that you know, really got me into The Cure, um, but also because it was one of those records that showed that you can have the poppiest record in the world, you can go out there and you can be poppier than any boy band, any girl group, anything that's got Simon Cowell's name over it. Um, but it doesn't mean you have to be stupid. You know? And The Love Cats is an incredibly intricate and clever record. Um, you know, it sounds really weird. I mean, it sounded weird then, mainly because it's got that sort of that weird double bass on it, which just wasn't a very trendy record to have on records in 1983. But it sounds really weird, and yet it's instantly accessible. So it's one of those Cure records, you could stick that on at a wedding, and um, your granny would probably keep, keep dancing to it, you know but you could stick it on at the most alternative, alternative disco and uh, everybody would drop their cool for you know, five minutes and dance along to it. So, I mean, it's, it's a brilliant pop record and you know, one of the responsible, really, for The Cure reaching that really wider mainstream audience. And that, those singles were really important. I think hardcore Cure purists who were into the band prior to those records had a tendency to sneer at the time. But I think, you know, a few years on, they probably actually appreciated what Robert Smith was doing with those singles because they were quite important to him as well. He needed to get away from the depressing angst rock, uh, otherwise, you know, he probably wouldn't have been able to go on to make the later albums. But Robert Smith will not be fond of Love Cats precisely because uh, it's people's favourite. And he knows that really there was a, you know, he does do that, he does novelty songs. He's very good at a novelty song because he's so infused with the spirit of what pop music is. He can do that, he can make novelty songs. Occasionally those novelty songs are blindingly, you know, interesting because they, you know, something like, um, I, w I wish I could be you or, or why can't I be you? It's like, it's, it's a weird combination of um, upbeat, but the lyrics themselves are, are still Smith lyrics, you know, and, 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 and he can do that. He can make great melodies. He can, he can you know, tap into pop history and, uh, and the great pop songs of David Bowie and, and Mark Bolan 
Uh, you know, that's that's what he can do. But it, it, it's something that ultimately he, he, he's bored with. He doesn't want to do it. But it's it's the, the curse of, of him in a way is that that's really what people remember. It's the upbeat, it's the pop choruses, it's the catchiness, not the, the epic, you know, textual glories where he's approaching some kind of, you know, postmodern classical music using the guitar almost in a sort of Lou Reed sense. I think, like, if you took the body of what we've done like, right from the beginning, right the way through, it's pretty evenly balanced between, like, unhappy and happy. 1983 also witnessed an important step in the development of The Cure as a visual art project. The band had decided to shoot a video for Let's Go To Bed, a move that began a long and much celebrated collaboration with director Tim Pope. Tim Pope's videos for In Between Days and Close To Me in particular were, you know, incredible, incredibly groundbreaking uh, videos. People think of the 80s as the golden age for the pop video, but actually 99% of them were rubbish and, uh, you know, the other 1% was just expensive rubbish. So to have something which clearly had not a great deal of money had been spent on, but there was an enormous amount of visual creativity in those videos and, uh, and indeed, you know, in loads of other videos that they made as well. But just the idea of, of Robert Smith in a wardrobe falling off a cliff uh, or being attacked by fluorescent gloves or whatever those things were, you're never quite sure what was going on in their videos, which was, you know, a bit different to the other stuff as well. So. Um, certainly livened up the chart show on many a Saturday morning. Tim Pope always did something that was more arty, more clever and uh, much more original. And so you knew if, you know, if there was a Cure single coming out, you couldn't wait to see the Cure video. They weren't a visual group, a visual act. And it, it is fascinating that they had that dimension given to them by, by uh, you know, uh, mainly Tim Pope sort of interpreting uh, the idea of, of what The Cure might be like if they were a wacky pop group, as they occasionally appeared to be. And I guess Pope gave them that, that image, that sense that they were, you know, almost like the British group Madness, you know, these incredible little kind of vignettes of, of eccentricity and exhibitionism, which live they weren't. They weren't that at all. But, but it was a fantastic way of, of sustaining themselves during the video era. Tim Pope managed to sort of get into the to that part of Robert Smith that is the exhibitionist, he's, you know, that, that does have the hair. He doesn't move like one, but he has the hair and he has the lips and he managed to create all sorts of visual symbols for that in these videos that, 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 that gave The Cure a lot, of, um, a lot of energy through the video period. In 1984, The Cure released The Top, a bleak and ill-received album that saw Thornley and Anderson leave the band following the subsequent world tour. Smith reorganised the band, adding drummer Boris Williams and guitarist Paul Thompson, as well as inviting Simon Gallup to rejoin on bass. The new lineup released Head on the Door in 1985. The album not only reached the UK top 10, but it also climbed to number 59 in the US, the first time that The Cure had broken the American top 100. I think the, the key Cure tracks probably in terms of cementing their popularity with the British public were in between days and close to me um, because really that was all the genius things that The Cure do just crammed into two songs you know you didn't have to listen to an entire album to get a sense of what they were doing um, you could just put one of those songs on and pretty much instantly know where Robert Smith was coming from because they were great tunes for a start um, and in other hands they could have just been probably fairly mainstream pop songs but because Robert Smith is not a member of a boy band, um, you know, they weren't. I think that, I think we, weirdly, the songs he does best, and it's perhaps not what he's known best for, is that he does actually write really good love songs. It's just that when you're listening to them, it's not always immediately apparent that it is a love song because he doesn't deal in the cliched. They were unclassifiable, and at their best, they always are, and they, they kind of leave in their wake ideas that they might be post punk, or they might be goth, or they might be, you know, power pop or they might be whatever but often I think it's because they're just writhing about in their own particular area and what I ended up liking about them the most was that they they always confounded expectations based on his sheer sort of um, perversity that almost if he was about to be something that could be classified he would turn his back on it so if he felt they were becoming too much a pop group then he'd, then he'd go into the soundscape and if he felt that they were being too much you know art pop then he'd, then he'd turn his back on that and, and, and that was in the end one of the things that I really started to enjoy about him was also perversity. A lot of the tracks are not time specific, they're not, because they, they never followed a fashion, like they never tried to make a punk rock track or a, 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 
a ska track or a two-tone track or whatever, or a new romantic track. They never got bogged down in going for that particular sound or that particular style or that particular structure or that particular vocal affectation. They really ploughed their own furrow. And because of that, OK, some of the recording techniques maybe sound a little bit dated now, but in general, a lot of that music, if it came out on the radio now for the first time, you'd never heard it before. It would be very difficult to say, when was this first recorded? You know, is this, is this a new band or is this an old band? And, and you know, if, if it's an old band, is that a 70s track, an 80s track, a 90s track? The Cure have dabbled in all sorts of genres in their time, but, I mean, the key to them is that they did essentially invent goth. Um, now, that obviously means Robert Smith is responsible for thousands upon thousands of really dreadful bands, but should never be held against the, against the Cure, um, because although, you know, they had all the the staples of goth in their element. You know, they wore black, they had big hair, uh, they wrote miserable songs. <laughs> um, you know, they just did it in a... Because they were the first, they did it in, you know, a really fresh and exciting way. And when the cure were goth, it never seemed to be quite such a sad thing as when Fields of Nephilim <laughs> were goth. Um, and so for a lot of people, they're always going to be associated with that movement. But the key to The Cure was that they were never just tied to that. And when Goth died, The Cure didn't die with it. Um, you know, they just reinvented themselves again and kept going. In 1986, The Cure released a collection of their singles, Staring at the Sea. The album went gold in the US and consolidated the transatlantic success of Head on the Door. The band followed up in 1987 with Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me, a double album often considered to be a mix of their best styles. The album spawned a raft of hit singles, both at home and in the US. Um. I think Catch is one of my favourite pure songs of all time. I think he's a great lyricist and that wonderful line. Um, even though it felt soft at the time, I always used to wake up sore and I just think that's absolutely brilliant. Lowell Tolhurst departed acrimoniously from The Cure in 1988. Tolhurst filed and eventually lost a lawsuit against the band claiming that his contribution merited greater financial reward than his contract provided for. The band replaced Tolhurst with Roger O'Donnell and released Disintegration in 1989. The album was a huge critical and commercial success, entering the UK chart at number two and the US Billboard at number 14. The band followed up the success of the album with a stadium tour on both sides of the Atlantic. The Cure peaked commercially and probably um, artistically on, you know, Disintegration, which was at the very end of the 80s for me. Um, since then, you know, The Cure haven't been cool. They weren't particularly cool before then, but they certainly have been nowhere near cool since then, until now, ironically, loads of bands have decided they're hip. But, they were always there, and the thing about The Cure is that they, the work they did in the 80s has basically ensured them against needing to be cool, um, because you wouldn't read about The Cure in the 90s in um, you know, trendy magazines, you wouldn't see them on the telly, but every time they did a gig, it would always be a really, really big gig, and it would always sell out, because they, you know, they've just got that army of devotees. They're always slightly marginalised, and they always have a minority uh, constituency. But the minority constituency can still be massive. You know, of course, it's just a flake of the record by the public, a tiny flake of it. But globally, as long as they're still in their punching, they're, they're making a fantastic living. There's always going to be people that are going to like us because of what we look like or because we're, we're a group. But at the same time, I think we have a high percentage of people who do listen to what we do and are very critical of what we do as well. We've always had a very critical audience, which from time to time can get annoying, but it's generally a good thing to have. In 1992, The Cure released the hugely successful Wish. 
The album went to number one in the UK and number two in the US and included the multi-platinum single Friday I'm In Love. However, subsequent lineup changes, the ongoing legal dispute with Tolhurst and the emergence of Britpop sidelined the cure for the rest of the early 90s. It's ironic, really, that in, in many ways, Robert Smith wrote the template for Britpop in that it was, you know, um, pop songs done in a quirky alternative way, which I'm sure a lot of those Britpop bands picked up on subconsciously, if nothing else. Um, but that was the movement that really sort of finished the cure off as a hip uh, band for the media. But um, it didn't kill them. It killed lots of other bands. In 96, a, a lot of bands who were experimental in nature or, or were interesting had a problem because of Britpop in this country, you know, in the in, in UK especially. But I think it spread wide apart. There was that sort of nostalgic need to go back to the 60s. Normal shapes of pop songs, you know, normal symbols of the swinging 60s, Union Jacks and, and the Beatles and, and something like The Cure. They were one of the groups that definitely would have suffered in that period because they were, they were by, by nature experimental. And you did get the feeling that groups like The Cure were slipping off the planet almost because it was a very tricky time for forward-thinking people and Robert Smith has always been a forward-thinking person wouldn't have wanted to join in with that grey... You know, Britpop is everything he does not believe in because it was so grey and conservative where he's, he's a flamboyant personality that's into dreams and exuberance. And I think, that, you know, that was one of those moments. There's been many of them where you think The Cure have gone. I mean, I think, for me, The Cure have split up hundreds of times. He's just never really told us officially, and it's never been the case, ultimately, because it's Robert Smith, and he's not split up, per se, although occasionally he has. So you did get... But you did get the feeling, the idea of the brand name, The Cure, it was all over, and you could not possibly see how it, how it could happen again. In 1995, with Williams and Thompson replaced by Perry Bermonte and Jason Cooper, the Cure began recording their 10th full studio album. Wild Mood Swings was released in 1996 and a world tour followed. The brief was really to uh, move the band on from where they'd been, because they'd been one of the biggest bands of the 80s and the early 90s. And he felt that... Um, my impression was that he felt slightly stagnated in what they'd been, and now was a whole new evolution of the band because two of the major members of the band had left. Uh, when I started there was no drummer so uh, we gradually put the band together over the first recording sessions um, and that was quite amusing where what we did was we, we put the basics of the tracks together uh, obviously myself recording and running around and then Robert, um, Perry and Simon playing along to a click track and then the drummers would come along and they would play just to that, not with the rest of the band. So I would have to put this relationship together between myself and, and the drummer as a musician and the rest of the band. So that was an interesting position to be in. And Robert would be kind of in this huge house with the rest of the band, sort of popping their head around the corner and seeing how things were going. So it was a very different beginnings to a record. The title in itself sort of encompasses basically the feel of the whole record because there are lots of different types of songs on it. Uh, from Want, which is, I think, the lead opening song, which is a full-on kind of wild rock track, um, to something like Bear, which is, I think, the last song on the record, which is this fantastically moody, big string, acoustic guitar kind of lament um, and then the 13th which is this almost uh, Brazilian-esque, South American-esque anyway, uh, a Western European's eye on what they think South American music can sound like. Um, there's lots of different flavours in the record and I think that's a good thing um, even though I might feel that there may be too, too many songs on the whole album. After the low-key release of another singles compilation, Galore, in 1998, The Cure began surfacing at the European summer festivals. Another studio album, Blood Flowers, was released in 2000 and was genuinely well received. The album managed to recapture the quintessential Cure sound and was seen as something of a return to form for the band. Smith revealed that after Faith and Disintegration, Blood Flowers was the third instalment of a trilogy. In 
2001, The Cure broke with fiction records, and Smith began to feel that the band had reached the end of its natural life. One year later, highly regarded producer and lifelong Cure fan Ross Robinson bumped into Smith at a hotel in Switzerland. Robinson, an influential new metal producer of acts such as Slipknot and Korn, persuaded Smith to begin another Cure project. The band signed a three-album deal with Geffen in May 2004, and their self-titled album, The Cure, was released in June of the same year. It is surprisingly good. I wasn't much of a fan of Blood Flowers, which were their, was their last one. Uh, it was billed as the sort of third part in the... Uh, depressing trilogy that is pornography disintegration it was part three um, it was still you know fairly it was still on the right record but I don't think expectations for this one were that high um, but coming to it in, in fact it's if people have heard Franz Ferdinand or the strokes or the rapture you know dropping cure's name uh, and wonder what they're getting into it's actually a really good record to buy because it does basically see Robert Smith you know, dabbling in all the things that he's done at various stages in his career. It sounds like all the classic bits of Cure stuck into one record. It's got a darkness to it. It's got a good driving bass line, melodic bass line. It's got, it's got the kind of, like, classic uh, Robert Smith vocals. But it's also um, encased in it and a really good pop song as well. So it's like they kind of, like, merge all the good periods of the band back into one, like, kind of song, which is a way to do a great comeback, is to get everything you were good at and put into one song if you can. So I think he's pulled that one off. I mean, I just think they'll go on and on and on. I can't see Robert... I mean, unless Robert fell out of love with music or Robert suddenly, you know, got some kind of block where he couldn't write anything. Um, but I just see The Cure going on and on and on and we'll all be at the nursing home singing old Cure songs and Robert might come in and do us a couple of new ones. Well, it's, it's interesting, Robert Smith, because every single time they put an album out, he always said it's the last one, and they're going to split the band up, and that's it, it's all over. But I think they'll be making records for another 20 years. You know, it's, it, I can't imagine him going out making a solo record. If he can make a solo record, but it won't be a serious record. I mean, Robert Smith is a cure, and the cure is Robert Smith. There's no getting away from it. So I can see the cure just every few years putting out another record. I mean, especially if they pull this, this, if they pull this comeback off, which is a very important one, and they do get a new record to do really well, it'll give them a platform to keep making new records. And I think they'll keep trying to find uh, new boundaries and new, new ways of trying to be the cure, but it'll still fit within their kind of either kind of the poppy cure or the dark cure kind of parameter. Well, I think Robert Smith will maintain the idea of the cure until his dying days, uh, as he always has done. Every time he's died, he's always held on to the idea of the cure, and in a funny sort of way, he's died many times and always held on to the idea of the cure. And I think as an artist, he can, he can keep going because he'll always have interesting things to say because he is an artist, and he'll always have kind of thoughts about how he can sonically make that contemporary, not in a fastable way, not, you know, suddenly becoming hip-hop or suddenly, you know, R&B or, or nicking, you know, kind of transient studio techniques, but just as a, as a, as a you know, a, a new piece of work that necessarily brings forward his past with him to create this kind of oeuvre that he now realises he has, you know. So I, I, I personally think, you know, um, that however much he tries to fool us now by pretending it's the last one or the farewell or the goodbye, just the very nature of the fact he's an artist will, will mean he keeps coming and, and, in a genuine sense, keeps surprising us with, with, with what he does. I think The Cure became such a success because the time was right um, for... Punk had opened the doors and then other stuff was going to come through and The Cure were doing something that didn't sound like anything else at all. Um, there was absolutely nothing doing the rounds um, like them. And the sound was different, but the songs were still perfect. I think The Cure, more than perhaps any band in history, succeeded entirely on their own terms. Um, they're absolutely impossible to pin down to just one thing. And um, that's, for a band that's been around for as long as they have, that's incredible, you know. Every other band becomes a cartoon sooner or later. And while, that, while there are cartoonish elements to what The Cure do, you can never just pin them down to one musical style. You can never just pin them down to, you know, one lyrical theme. You can never even pin Robert Smith down to just one haircut, because he has had more than one throughout his career. And that's probably the key to The Cure, is that they've never rested on their laurels. Um, they've never just thought, well, let's make an album to please our goth fan base, uh, you know, another album of gloomy rock. Uh, he's always 
kind of reacting against what he's done before. He always wants to take things somewhere different, and he nearly always has, and that's why the cure is successful. They never stopped working, and I think it was a time when, if you're playing live, there's a certain momentum that just builds up naturally, and timing, timing is everything, and they were the right all-male band to be hitting America at that point. They kind of represented a something to Americans that they couldn't get from their homegrown people. They were very good at being a pop band, even though they, even though they came from, the, from the, a very left-field kind of scene. They, they always had, Rob said, they always had a very good melodic touch. He's also a very good pop star and he's very charismatic. And also, they just hit a nerve, you know, for all the... Um, for, for, for people sitting in their bedrooms, miserable kid types, they always hit a nerve, those kind of people. So even when they went poppy, they just, just hit another generation, those kind of people, you know? So the more kind of artistic kind of people zoned in on the cure and I think I think they've always been very very good at doing that I think he's just a very he just it became a very good pop star because he looked really like a pop star like a uh, pop stars have to look kind of cuddly as well but it's, it's he also managed to keep the dark side in there as well which is like a very very good trick to play you can still get taken seriously as an artist even though you're a pin-up and you're a smash hits kind of pop star is it is it is it fine balancing act on one that one that he managed to pull off he has a beautiful voice he has a, a, a great guitar technique and, and writes the, the songs that are, 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 as a pop song, unbelievably catchy, and, and as sonic experiences, uh, unbelievably challenging. And there were these wonderful little bursts of luck, you know, the, the, the right place, right time kind of scenario. But I think the, the best thing about it ultimately is that uh, he is, you know, he's in a very, he's, he's a very attractive kind of personality, as, as, as peculiar and as odd as he is. In fact, he's a very attractive personality because of that. And, and at, at stages in teenage life, someone like Robert Smith, in the great pop sense, is the kind of guy you'd want to be your hero. He seems to live out your, your fears. He lives out your vulnerabilities. He, he's created an alternative lifestyle. He's, he's, he rejects authority. He looks like he rejects authority. He sings songs that are about mysterious things. All those kind of factors, when they're also combined with great pop songs, you know, will mean you will have success because there is a teenage audience and, and nowadays an audience in their 30s, 40s and 50s that really identifies with that kind of struggle. And it's beautifully presented, you know. The Cure offer is a combination not just of words and music, but with their videos and album sleeves, they represent a whole art project. Smith has always played himself, maybe a bit plumper these days, but possessed by the same mixture of playfulness and anxiety that he was exhibiting a quarter of a century ago. The story continues.